حيصير لي اول محاضرة انا as I told you before انه اللكتشر دي هنتعرف فيها شنو هو الاورال ميديسن and what the oral medicine included وشنو يعني كلمة oral medicine diagnosis ومن وين جاي الكلمات دي and so on this is Dr. Iman al-Sheikh and this is our first lecture in oral medicine course known as stomatology from the name معناها the science the science of what let's know or نعمل define لي stomatology stomatology is the science of structure function and disease of the oral cavity يعني هو العلم اللي بيعمل لي including لي الاناتومي الفسيولوجي الباثولوجي بتاع الاورال كافيتي يعني باختصار الستوماتولوجي هو الباطنة كريت بتاع الفم تمام يعني زي ما تخصص الباطنة بتاع الجسم العموم من كده فإحنا عندنا هنا ده الستادي بتاع الباطنة بتاع الأورال كافيتي أوكي to study this science we need study methods such as examination of the related history يعني أخذ من الpatient history بتاعه أوكي الحاجة الثانية Evaluation of the clinical signs and symptoms. You know, I'm a disabled patient. I'm a patient. Examination by my eye and tools or fingers. Use of biochemical, microscopic, and radiological procedures. Okay. What is it? What is it? What is it? Clinical investigations. What is it? It includes radiological procedures and biochemical procedures that are done in a laboratory. اوكي طيب احنا بنعمل الحاجات دي كلها ليه؟ تو ستابلش دايجنوزس عرفنا الدايجنوزس سو الهدف الاساسي بتاعنا تريتمنت ثيرابيوتيك مانجمنت اوف ذا كونديشن اوكي ده معنى كلمه استوماتولوجي طيب دايجنوزس هسه احنا قلنا احنا عايزين نعمل دايجنوزس عندنا دايجنوزس وعندنا كمان اورال دايجنوزس دايجنوزس هي بروسس اوف ايفالويتنج بيشنتس هيلث از ويل از ريزولتنج اوبينيونز Formulated by the clinician. So I want to answer. No, give the patient that. We are doing an evaluation for the status. We are doing an evaluation for the status. So we know what is it. Diagnosis. We know what is it. The patient is doing what. Okay. Oral diagnosis is the art of using scientific knowledge to identify oral disease processes and to distinguish one disease from another. Or diagnosis, إنه أنا أستخدم, okay, اللي هو فن استخدام ال knowledge في إنه أنا أعرف ال ال diseases أقدر أعمل differential diagnosis وأقدر بعد كده أصل لل final diagnosis, okay. ما هقدر أعمل diagnosis إذا ما كان عندي scientific background إذا ما كان عندي science in my head ما هقدر أعمل diagnosis. Okay, let's move to our major definition اللي هو oral medicine. Oral medicine is that area of a special competence in the district concerned with what? يعني هي oral medicine ده مهمة شنو يعني هو حصة خاصة كده من the dentistry بتهتم بشنو بتهتم ب diseases involving the oral and paraoral structures يعني the diseases اللي هي شنو من الأعراض بتاعتها الأساسية oral and paraoral signs and symptoms okay include the principles of medicine that relate to the mouth as well as a research in biological and pathological and clinical sphere okay but do oral medicine include diagnosis and management medically the diseases specific to the oral facial tissues and oral manifestations of systemic disease and the systemic disease for example al renal diseases okay or um, liver disease uh, al disease is the systemic disease okay yani mask lay organ the organ da mash the system bita al jism okay so we say the systemic disease systemic diseases bia imma bitkun indha manifestations la alaqa bil organ nafsu fil area al mash fiha al tawzi' bitahtu او بتكون عندها اعراض الجسم كله طيب ممكن يكون عندها سكن مانفستيشنز 
يكون عندها نيورولوجيكال ساينز كمان ممكن يكون عندنا كمان اورال مانيفستيشنز يعني في ديزيزز معينه عندها اعراض في الاورال كافيتي انا اذا شفت شفت الحاجه دي هقول انه ده بتاعت الديزيز الفلاني الديزيز الفلاني عنده الفيتشر دي بتظهر في الاورال كافيتي خلاص ف it also includes behavioral disorders وكمان oral dental treatment بتاعت مين بتاعت ال medical compromised patients okay we all know who are medical compromised patients يعني هنا ال oral medicine ده ممكن اديه definition بانه هو diagnosis خلاص عرفنا ال term بتاع diagnosis يعني شنو and treatment of oral lesions as well as non-surgical management of temporomandibular joint disorders and facial pain in addition to dental treatment for medically compromised patients in an outpatient setting okay or in an inpatient setting under general anesthesia including specialty care in periodontics and endodontics طيب شنو هي non-surgical management of temporomandibular joint disorders طيب اذا عندي disorder related to TMJ temporomandibular joint هو ال disorder ده عندنا options بتاعت treatment من ال options بتاعت treatment non-surgical options و surgical options ال non-surgical options بنعالجها within the field بتاع ال oral medicine ال surgical procedures طبعا بنعمل refer ل surgeon وهو بيتولى الموضوع بتاع ال management of the procedures ال disorder Oral medicine is defined as the definition according to um, American Association of the Oral Medicine. Arafali bin Huaybar and discipline of dentistry that concern with the oral health care of medically compromised or complex patients, including the diagnosis and management of medical conditions that affect the oral and maxillofacial region. يعني باختصار كده ال discipline بتاعنا بتاع ال oral medicine ده هو بيتشاف كالكروس رود او برج ما بين الميديسن والدنتستري اوكي فلانه عندي سيستميك ديزيز وعندها مانفستيشنز وممكن المانفستيشنز تظهر قبل المانفستيشنز اللي ليها علاقه بالاورجن او الديزيز اكثر وتظهر اول اوكي وممكن كمان اقدر اعمل يعني مانجمنت لي يعني اقلل اعمل كنترول للكونديشن بتاع البيشنت اوكي لانه ريسنتلي اكتشفوا انه أم ال يعني في علاقة ما بين السيستميك ديزيزز و الأورال ديزيزز، أوكي؟ طيب الأورال ديزيزز يا يعني إما إذا زادت حدتها بتأثر لي على ال الديزيز اللي هو قاعد كرونيك مع البيشن، أو العكس إذا الكونديشن بتاع البيشن بقى uncontrolled وعنده سيستميك أو complicated ديزيز، فممكن يأثر لي على الأورال هيلث بتاعته، تمام؟ مهم جدا انه احنا نعرف اورال ميديسين وكل دكتور اسنان لازم يكون عنده علم بشوية حاجات اساسية جدا في الاورال ميديسين لانه ما ممكن يجيني بيشنت عنده ليجن واقعد اقول له انتظر اشوف ده شنو لحظة اتصل بدكتور احولك لدول ثاني نو اي هاف تو نو سم بيزك وفي الحالات الادفانس انا بعمل ريفيرال بيشنت اوكي طيب آه بنعرف oral medicine ليه؟ طيب oral medicine the goal from the oral medicine is to provide education, research and service for healthcare professionals and public. Education لكل الفئات بتاعت التعليم وبنعمل research اوكي في الفيلد بتاع البيولوجي related للاورال diseases يعني بنكتشف ال causes بنكتشف ال ال treatments بتاعت ال diseases بنكتشف علاقة الأمراض مع بعضها اوكي ده كله نرجع نعمل له شنو نعمل له teaching أو educating لأنه لل healthcare professionals اوكي and this service is going to the society and healthcare professionals يعني الحاجات دي كلها تصب في مصلحة ال patients و ال professionals أو هما ال healthcare professionals Okay. In the field of the oral medicine, we have a basic understanding of various diseases and their impact on the oral tissue. So, 
it is easy for the practitioner to recognize the presence of the major systemic diseases as I said before and this then accordingly this will make again with Khalini and as a dentist to make the correct diagnosis and to decide the better treatment plan you know like the amal treatment plan tamam. so as to do so justice what's happening to him okay by the oral medicine زي ما احنا قلنا انه هو علم انا لو ما عندي basic دراسي للdiseases والimpact على الoral tissues انا ما هقدر to recognize what is going on with the patient so لما يكون عندي basic بتاعي so I can recognize the presence of any major systemic disease وبالتالي هقدر اصل لي diagnosis واحقد تلي treatment plan مزبوطة and هأقدر أعرف what is going on with the patient وأشرح له الحاجة دي وزي ما إحنا قلنا إنه في الأورال ميديسن فيلد مينلي عندنا الدياغنوزيس والميديكال مانجمنت البيشنس اللي هما complex medical with a complex medical disorders طيب بالنسبة لنا إحنا كناس بنتدرب كأورال ميديسن we are provide dental and oral health care for patients with medical diseases may affect dental treatment including patients receiving treatment for cancer and diabetes cardiovascular diseases and infectious diseases in the previous slide uh, I will tell you that it can affect all conditions it can affect all systemic disease it can affect oral health or the other so here I am ممكن اعمل مانجمنت للكونديشنز دي وبالتالي بعمل كنترول للديزيز اللي هي سيستميك اوكي ف ان جنرال كده الفيت على اورال ميديسن بيعمل لي دايجنوزس وبنعمل فيه دايجنوزس والميديكال مانجمنت البيشنتس اللي هم وذ كومبلكس ميديكال ديس اوردرز تمام الميديكال كومبلكس ديس اوردرز دي بتعمل لي انفولفينج الاورال ميكروزا والسليفري جلاس ممكن تعمل لي اورال فيشل بين سي ان جي فأنا بعالج له الحاجات المصاحبة لي الميديكال كونديشن بتاعه. Okay. In the oral medicine practice provide physical and medical evaluation, head and neck examination, laboratory analysis, oral diagnosis and oral therapeutic. يعني أنا بعمل examination وبعمل investigations بتاعتي وصل للdiagnosis وببدي treatment للconditions المذكورة حاليا عندنا vesicular full of lesions or conditions vesicular full of lesions from the name اللي هي عبارة عن vesicles or vulna موجودة في disease as a sign and symptoms ulcerative mucosal diseases اللي هي بيكون عندنا ulcers في oral mucosa painful and burning mucosa infectious oral diseases or conditions which arising from the medical treatment or oral manifestations of systemic diseases in addition to the delivery gland dysfunctions. As we have seen the street of the oral medicine, we have the first step in the oral medicine, the oral diagnosis, examination, physical and medical evaluation, investigations, management of the oral dental diseases, وبعض الحاجات اللي احنا ذكرناها زي الاورال ثيرابيوتيك منتل مانجمنت اوف ذا ميديكال كومبرومايز بيشن كمان عندنا حاجه مهمه جدا الدنت الكانسر ديتكشن اند بريفنشن هنا يا اما انا بعمل ديجنوزس لكانسر في مالجنانت ليجن او بعرف البري مالجنانت ليجنز اند كونديشنز وبعمل بريفنشن انها تتحول الى كانسر حاجة مهمة لازم احنا يعني ناخد بالنا منها ونعرفها كويس جديد عندنا كاتيجوري موجودة في الاورال ميديسن عبارة عن اوتو اميون ديزيز اوكي دوز اوتو اميون ديزيزز انا لازم افهم هما بيشتغلوا كيف يعني كيف بتحصل الاوتو اميون كونديشن ون اوف ذا فيري امبورتنت رياكشنز وبتكون الكوز بتاع الموست اوف ذوز كونديشنز اللي هي انتي جين انتي بودي رياكشن بيفور وي جوينج 
to the antigen antibody reaction let's refresh ourselves on it the question is the immunity the immunity is the resistance exhibited by the host host is my body toward the injury the injury the caused by microorganisms will protect بتاعته يعني باختصار هو reaction of the body against الحاجات الغريبة اللي هي احنا بنسميها antigen immunity against infectious diseases consists of two main types of the يعني الجيش اللي عندنا دي two types من الجيوش اللي هو humoral و cellular وكل واحد من الجيوش عنده ال effective cells بتاعته The uses of an immunity, understanding the disease, which helps to understand etiology and pathogenesis of many diseases, to development of the vaccine, treatment of many diseases, and it helps define with the future susceptibility to the disease with the help of human lymphocyte antigen typing system. Well, as we are aware, we are going to this. Classification of the immune system into innate, and innate that we have to test from what we have to test from the clinical and the clinical level, and acquire the one that we have to test from at the time of our development in our lives, which is going to be active and passive, and each one divided into natural and artificial. Uh, okay, here I have a few videos that will tell me the two types of immunity. هتعرف على ال innate وال adaptive and so on وبأمثلة بسيطة شديد نقدر نفهم بيها أكتر عندنا three videos بتوضح لي الموضوع ده ممكن نتفرج عليهم carefully و have a nice time Our body has a powerful army that protects it from various types of threats These threats can come in the form of mechanical injuries the entry of germs or the entry of other foreign particles like dust this personal army is called the immune system. Every day we encounter a huge number of bacteria, viruses, and other disease-causing organisms. However, we don't fall ill every other day, which is due to our immune system, an army of cells that is always roaming our body, ready to ward off any attack. The immune system can be broadly divided into two parts, innate and adaptive immunity. Innate immunity, or nonspecific immunity, is the body's first natural defense to any intruder. This system doesn't care what it's killing. Its primary goal is to prevent any intruder from entering the body, and if it does enter, then the immune system neutralizes this intruder. It doesn't differentiate between one pathogen and another. The first component of this defensive system is our skin. Any organism trying to get into the body is stopped by the skin, our largest organ, which covers us. Secondly, there is the mucus lining of all our organs. The sticky, viscous fluid traps any pathogens trying to get past it. These are the two physical barriers. However, we also have chemical barriers, such as the lysozyme in the eyes, or the acid in the stomach, which can kill pathogens trying to gain entry. The genitourinary tract and other places have their own normal flora or microbial community. These compete with pathogens for space and food and therefore also act as a barrier. The next line of defense is inflammation, which is done by mast cells. These cells are constantly searching for suspicious objects in the body. When they find something, they release a signal in the form of histamine molecules. These alert the body and blood is rushed to the problem area. This causes inflammation and also brings leukocytes, or white blood cells, which are soldiers in our body's cellular army. Once they come, all hell breaks loose. Sometimes, however, the intruder may not be a germ, but rather a harmless thing like a dust particle. The body still causes a full immune reaction to this intruder, which is how allergic reactions occur. In the fortress of our body, the leukocytes are VIPs. They have an all-access pass to the body, except, of course, to the brain and spinal cord. Our leukocytes come in many types. Those that belong to the innate system are the phagocytes. These cells can either patrol your body, like the neutrophils, or they can stay in certain places and wait for their cue. Neutrophils are the most abundant cells. 
they patrol the body and can therefore get to a breach site very quickly. These cellular soldiers kill the infectious cell and then die, which leads to the formation of pus. There are also the big bad wolves, or the macrophages. These cells are like hungry, ravenous monsters who simply engulf unwanted pathogens. Instead of roaming freely in our blood, they are collected in certain places. These cells can consume about 100 pathogens before they die, but they can also detect our own cells that have gone rogue, such as cancer cells, and kill them too. Beyond that, we also have the natural killer cells. These cells can efficiently detect when our own cells have gone rogue, or are infected with, say, a virus. NKCs detect a protein produced by normal cells called the major histocompatibility complex, or MHC. Basically, whenever a cell isn't normal, it stops producing this protein. The NKCs move around constantly, checking our cells for this type of deficiency. And when they find an abnormal cell, they simply bind to it, release chemicals, and destroy it. The last cells of our innate immune system are the dendritic cells. These are found in places that come in contact with the outside environment, such as the nose and lungs. They are the link between our innate and adaptive immune systems. They eat a pathogen and then carry information about it to our adaptive immune system cells. This information is produced and shared in the form of antigens. Antigens are the traces that pathogens leave behind. They are molecules found on the surface of pathogens that can be detected by our adaptive immune system for recognition. The dendritic cells pass on this information to our T cells. However, macrophages can also perform this function. Now, there is also the adaptive or acquired immune system. This system is more efficient as it can differentiate between different types of pathogens. It has two main components, T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes. T cells come into play when an infection has already occurred, thus bringing about the cell-mediated immune response. B cells join the fight when the pathogens have entered, but haven't yet caused any disease. This is called the humoral immune response. Some T cells take signals from the dendritic cells or macrophages, and are thus called helper T cells. They perform two key tasks forming effector T cells, which are basically cells that cycle through the body and call in the cavalry, namely other white blood cells. Helper T cells also form memory T cells, which keep a record of this antigen for future reference. Sometimes, some cells of our body know that they have lost the battle. They have become heavily infected with pathogens, so there is no hope left for them. At this point, the immune system brings out the cytotoxic T cells. These cells rush over and perform a mercy killing for the infected and dying cell. Furthermore, we have the B cells. They produce chemicals called antibodies, which fit on the antigens of pathogens, much like how a lock and key fit together. These antibodies crowd around a pathogen and act like tags. They signal the macrophages to come and kill the marked pathogen. B cells also produce memory B cells when they encounter an antigen. The B and T memory cells jointly maintain a record of all encountered infections and thus strengthen and solidify the body's immune response to these infections in the future. Our innate response is quicker, though nonspecific. It gets into action within hours and is pretty strong. However, when things get out of hand, the innate system calls for help from the acquired immune system. This system can take days to mount a response, but the next time we encounter that pathogen, it won't make us get sick. In short, every day that we spend being healthy is all thanks to our immune system, so it definitely deserves our respect. Hello and welcome to another video. This video is mainly going to be about the innate immune system. Now, your immune system uses two main strategies to defeat any type of unwanted invaders. One of the strategies is called the innate immune system, and the other one is called the acquired immune system. The innate immune system is mainly present since birth and is therefore sometimes also called the natural immune system, while the acquired, however, forms during a person's lifetime and is therefore sometimes also called the adaptive. Now, just remember that the baby also has some type of acquired immune system. I just put the baby there to show you that you've always had the innate immune system ever since you were born. So now let's put this to practice. Imagine we have three different types of bacteria, right? The innate immune system is what we call nonspecific because it actually works against any type of agents equally.
The adaptive, however, works very specific, as you see right here. And not only that, upon defeating the bacteria, you gain some kind of immunological memory, which usually becomes enhanced upon repeated exposure to the same agents. The innate immunity doesn't really have that, and so let's see how that works. We mainly classify the innate immune system into three different types. The first is what we call general factors, and we've got the cellular factors, and we also have the humoral factors. Um, the general factors include physiological barriers at the portal of entry, like the skin and the mucous membranes, and they're usually, and logically enough, the first line of defense. Next, we have the pyrogenic reactions. Now, don't get scared if you haven't heard this term before. I'll get more into this later when I talk about the uh, macrophages mainly. But uh, pyrogenic reactions often uh, refer to as fever. Some viruses and bacteria cannot really replicate optimally because the body changes its temperature. So uh, that's why we call it the general factors because it works generally by increasing the temperature. Another general factors are secretion. You know, secretion of different enzymes, fatty acids. The cellular factors, we got your own microbiota fighting for space and food. Phagocytosis by cells like neutrophils and macrophages. They do that by the different receptors they have on the surface. We also got natural killer cells. They're really important for the antiviral immune response. These cells can bind to surface of antigens by using toll-like receptors, which usually lead to inflammatory response. Um, we also get humoral factors, which include the complement system and the interferons. Now, I know this seems a lot, but trust me, it all gets logical once you understand the concepts. In my opinion, if you want to learn immunology properly, you need to understand different parts individually before you can understand the whole concept together in, in a system. And that's what I'm aiming to show you, everything individually first, and then put them all together and show you how this works in the system. Alright, so in this video, I'm mainly going to focus on the general factors because those are really important factors to start with when you want to understand immunology. Now, imagine these are your epithelial cells. Let's say this is your skin, for example. Um, the first one includes physical barrier where bacteria cannot really enter because of the tight junctions these cells really have. Another mechanism is when the bacteria can't enter because of secreted products, could be free fatty acids released by your gastrointestinal tract or enzymes released at the mucous membrane. So let's do it like that. In the saliva, sweat glands and tears, we have something called lysozyme, which when secreted out, they break down the peptidoglycan layer of the bacterial cell wall. Next, you know the gastrointestinal tract? You got some cells on the walls of your stomach called parietal and chief cells. Chief cells can release pepsin, which breaks down the uh, proteins of certain bacteria, and parietal cells mainly release hydrochloric acid for lowering the pH. We can also have defensins in the gastrointestinal tract, and the list goes on and on. The point is that we secrete out quite a lot of substances as a part of our general innate immunity. Some bacteria can actually get through all of this uh, mess without even getting hurt. And those are the bacteria that usually makes us sick. All right, so what else do we have? You know the normal microbiota you have in your body? They actually protect you by making a hard environment for the foreign bacteria to grow in, by taking up space and food, for example. So um, that's mainly the general factors I wanted to talk about. Now, from the cellular factors, we've already talked about the microbiota, limiting the pathogenic bacteria from growing. In my next video, we will look at what toleric receptors are and how phagocytosis happens in details and steps in inflammation. Um, natural killer cells has a cytotoxic mechanism, and I feel like it's more logical to talk about it later when I talk about the cellular immune response, as it kind of fits more there. All right, so let's look at these. So we are going to go ahead and continue our discussion of the immune system, and we'll be discussing innate immunity. Now, before we discuss innate immunity, you need to understand that there's actually two different types of immunity, one of those being innate immunity, which is also called nonspecific immunity, and the other is called acquired or adaptive immunity, which is also known as specific immunity. But just to give you a quick overview of both of these, when you first think about the nonspecific or the innate immunity, 
It's a very rapid response. This is your first line of defense. And what this does is it gives your body time for the specific immunity to kick in. So innate immunity is always there. It's present. It's going to happen as soon as your body is invaded by a foreign object. And then the specific immunity will take over after that. It's rapid and it's also not selective. So it's not targeting specific species of invaders, for example. It's not specific. It just wants to kill foreign invaders and that's the end of it. The innate immunity involves physical and chemical barriers and it also includes cellular defenses. Now, once the innate immunity has occurred, then the next type of immunity that will occur or kick in is the acquired immunity. It's a slow response. And so because it's a slow response, it's very selective in what it's killing. It may kill a specific bacterial cell or a specific virus. And specific immunity includes two different types of responses, humoral responses, which are also called antibody-mediated responses, and cell-mediated responses, which are also called cytotoxic lymphocytes. Here's our analogy. When you think about an innate response, the castle is the body, and the first thing that this innate response wants to do is it wants to prevent that invader from entering the body. And once that invader invades the body, then the innate response will have some other methods for killing the invaders as well. These things are all taking place as the acquired response is just getting started. But remember, it's slow, so it takes a while to get the acquired response going. So neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, and monocytes are all cells that are important in an innate response. The lymphocytes, on the other hand, are the type of white blood cell that are important in the acquired response. You don't have to memorize the amount of each of these cells in a microliter or their diameters or any of that. You need to understand their anatomical features and their functions. So these are important columns here. But you do also have to know their abundance, their relative abundance. So again, if you remember, never let monkeys eat bananas, that tells you the most abundant leukocyte all the way to the least abundant leukocyte, which are your bananas or your basophils. So that way you don't have to memorize the amount per microliter. The reason this is important is because if you're looking at a slide, let's say you take a blood smear on a microscope slide and, and this is a healthy person and you're going through and you're identifying all the various white blood cells. Well, if you're finding more basophils than you are neutrophils, then you're probably not correctly identifying those cells. Okay, so here's a flow chart that I put together to help organize the innate versus the adaptive response. So you're definitely gonna wanna use this as your roadmap. We're discussing the innate responses in this part, in part two. First, let's start with the physical and the chemical barriers. If you think about these as being the wall of the castle. So the first thing I'd like to discuss are the lysozymes. So you have lysozymes that are in your tears and other secretions. These are not lysosomes. Lysosomes are different. Lysozymes are antibacterial. So when you cry, it's actually a good thing because you're killing any kind of bacteria that's on your skin. You also have the skin then, and the skin is a physical barrier. The skin also has fatty acids and some normal flora as well. That will affect the pH and some foreign invaders cannot survive on the skin just because of the normal flora on our skin. Then you have the mucus and the cilia that lie in the trachea. The mucus traps any foreign particles and then the cilia works that debris up the respiratory tract and into your mouth so that you can either swallow it or spit it out. If you swallow it, it goes down into your stomach. And remember the stomach has a pH of two, it's very acidic. So it's likely to kill most invaders, but not all. Now, taking a closer look at the skin, we're not going to spend time on the skin. This is anatomy, but you should realize in this course that you do have two major skin layers, the epidermis and the dermis. So pay attention to those two layers and know where those two layers are located, which one's on the outermost, which one's innermost. The dermis then, the only thing that you need to know about the dermis are the sebaceous glands. And I want you to use your textbook to figure out 
What's the function of the sebaceous glands? Why are they important in the immune response? Then we have inflammation. So inflammation is part of the innate immunity as well. When you think about inflammation, it's your body's response to tissue damage or microbial invasion. So you've sprained your ankle and your ankle is now inflamed. You stepped on a nail and so now you have tissue damage, a microbial invasion by stepping on a nail. So the goals of inflammation are listed here for you. You want to bring phagocytes to the injured area because if you can control those invaders at the area that they've invaded, then they can't spread throughout the body. You want to stop them there. So if you can bring those phagocytes to the injured area, you can destroy inactivate invaders, you can remove any kind of cellular debris, and you can start preparing for healing. So let's take a look at this flow chart. The leukocyte that automatically will start phagocytosing as soon as invaders enter into that wound are your macrophages. So those macrophages are there and they immediately start attacking foreign invaders that enter the wound. The bacterial invasion itself and the tissue damage as well can cause the mast cells to release histamine. Histamine then we know causes vasodilation. So when an arterial vasodilates, that means you have less resistance, right? And therefore more blood flow to the injured area. So because there's more blood flow to the injured area, that's why it becomes red and that's why it gets hot. So because there's more blood there, that means that you have an increase in certain plasma proteins that may be important in the healing process. So these may be clotting factors, for example, that would prevent you from bleeding out. The release of histamine by the mast cells also increases the capillary permeability. So what I want you to do is think about a capillary here, and I'm just going to draw three endothelial cells that are forming the walls of this capillary. And when you have histamine release, the pore size has increased significantly. So if you increase the pore size, that means more fluid can flow through those pores. So that means you're going to get a local accumulation of fluid, some of that fluid being in the interstitial fluid. Remember that we've talked about swelling or what we call edema and excess of interstitial fluid. It can also cause pain because you have excess fluid in an area and the skin can only stretch so much that causes pain. Pain is a good thing because pain actually forces you to rest whatever part of your body is injured and that way it can repair itself if it's resting. Because you have this increased capillary permeability, then that's going to increase the number of phagocytes that can make it to the tissue, like your macrophages. If you have more phagocytes, that's going to increase their secretions, and their secretions can cause systematic responses like fever, for example. All in all, then, this is an inflammatory response, and all of the information in red here, these are all cardinal signs of inflammation. And all of these cardinal signs of inflammation are because you had changes in blood vessel function, the blood vessel vasodilated. When we talk about phagocytosis, this is a form of endocytosis, but specifically, how is it achieved? So it's going to be your job to fill in these steps. Don't go into more, any more detail than what these four steps are asking for here. Opsonins, I do want you to look into opsonins and, and why do we need opsonins? Why are opsonins important in phagocytosis? Then we have interferon. This is another type of innate immunity. And the goal of interferon is to interfere with viral replication. Now, many of you have had intro zoology, and so you know that when a virus gets inside of a cell, the virus takes over the machinery of that cell. And so it starts producing its own viral RNA and its own proteins. So there's some other functions of interferon that are listed here. And go ahead and read them. And at this point, realize that there are other functions for interferon besides interfering with viral replication. So let's take a look at how this will work. We're going to take a cell and it's been invaded by a virus. So what the cell does once the cell is invaded by the virus the cell is going to be releasing interferon. So the interferon is going to enter the extracellular fluid and it's going to travel to 
healthy cells, cells that have not been invaded by the virus. And when it binds to these receptors on an uninvaded cell, this uninvaded cell now will produce inactive enzymes. So basically this cell is just waiting. It's waiting to be invaded by a virus. Because what these enzymes will do once they become activated is they will break down viral messenger RNA and they'll inhibit protein synthesis. Now, here comes our virus. It invades this cell. So those inactive enzymes are now active enzymes. We're going to stop protein synthesis of the virus. So if a virus cannot multiply inside of a cell, the virus is dead. Viruses rely on cells in order to make their own proteins. And they, again, take over the machinery of the cell. So if they can't do that, they have nothing to survive on. This is why we call it interferon. Interferon is interfering with the virus. It's interfering with its replication. So next we have the natural killer cells. Natural killer cells are kind of like lymphocytes. They're important in the innate response. And they're going to release some chemicals called perforins that we'll discuss here in a second. They're going to target cancer cells and they target virally infected cells. And they're going to lyse the membranes of those cells. So let's look at how natural killer cells work. This killer cell here is a natural. So it binds to the target cell. Once they come into contact, the natural killer cell releases perforins. What perforins do is they create a pore in the membrane of the invader. So if we do that, then water and ions can rush in. We increase the permeability. So if you increase the permeability for water and ions into the cell, the cell will swell and burst. It's going to lyse. Then we have the complement system. The complement system is activated by two different means. The only one we'll discuss here is listed here at number one. We will discuss number two here later. But first, let's focus on number one when we activate a complement system. So here you have a bacterial cell. And on the surface of it is some carbohydrate. That carbohydrate is recognized by a complement protein. So these complement proteins are floating around in your plasma. That's where they're located. They're in the plasma, cruising around. And when the complement protein recognizes this carbohydrate chain, the complement protein will bind to the plasma membrane of this bacterial cell. And once it binds to the plasma membrane, that creates a whole cascade of events that end up developing what's called a membrane attack complex, a MAC. So this membrane attack complex is essentially a pore. So once you develop the pore, fluid can rush into the cell and then the cell will burst and it will lyse. So that kills that target cell as well. So complements really good in killing bacterial invaders. So innate responses are really good. They're quick, but they have their limitations. They're not specific. They're not gonna kill specific bacterial species, for example. And they're also short-term. They don't last very long. So the problem with it is that because they're short-term and they're not specific, then you have to have a smart system. And that's what adaptive immunity is all about. So in the next part, we're going to start discussing adaptive immunity, and specifically, we're going to look at characteristics of your B and your T cells. طيب نجي للحتة اللي احنا قلنا هي مهمة شديد بالنسبة لنا اللي هي انتجين انتبادي ويأكشن ولازم نعرف كيف الرياكشن ده بيحصل شنو هو الانتجين وكيف الانتجين بيعمل لي سيميوليشن للبادي رياكشن and so on let's go طيب أول حاجة نتعرف على الأنتجين شنو هو الأنتجين؟ الأنتجين هو any substance which when introduced parenterally into a body stimulates the production of an 
انتي بودي شنو الكلام ده يعني الانتيجين ده هو عبارة عن سابستنس السابستنس ده ممكن يكون فارين بادي وممكن يكون something within the body خلاص اللي هو when introduce into a body بيعمل ليش بيعمل لي استيميوليشن للإميون سيستم إنه يعمل لي production of an antibody اوكي وبعد كده بيعمل لي react مع الانتيبودي ده The immune system can respond to antigen either by cell-mediated immunity or by humoral immunity. يعني antigen ده لما to be introduced into the body, الجسم بيتفاعل معه يا إما عن طريق الانتيبوديز اللي هي الهيمرال immunity زي ما احنا عرفنا من الفيديوز أو عن طريق cell-mediated immunity اللي هي عن طريق cells اللي هي الفاجوسايت ليكوسايت. طيب السايز بتاع الانتجين ده الانتجين دي قالوا لي انها هي large molecules over than 1000 molecular weight وال smaller molecules ما بتقدر تعمل لي provoke immune response unless انها تعمل شنو pound لي large carrier molecules okay the complete antigen is able to induce antibody Formation and produces specific and observable reaction with antibody. So, produce. يعني لازم يكون عندها سايز معين عشان تقدر إنها تعمل لي induce لي ال antibody formation وبالتالي هي تعمل لي reaction. عندنا حاجة اسمها هابتن هابتن هي عبارة عن substances which are incapable of inducing antibody formation by themselves يعني دي غير الانتجين الانتجين لما يدخل البادي بيعمل لي simulation للانتبادس okay. لكن هنا الهابتن لما تبي introduce ما عنده القدرة انه يعمل لي Uh, inducing the antibody formation by themselves. لكن إذا جاء جاءت حاجة مساعدة وعملت لي induce فالانتيبودي بيتفاعل مع الهابتنس. And so on the epitope. Epitope هو the smallest unit of to antigenicity is known. أصغر وحدة أو أصغر substance that you can find as an antigen. و نسميه الابيتوب or الابيتوب or الانتجينيك ديترمينانت اوكي وده طبعا الهابتنس والابيتوب زي هم لازم تو بي باوند مع حاجه ثانيه اوكي تو بي كابل تو ستيميوليت الاميون سيستم اوكي عرفنا الانتجين نعرف من هو الانتيبودي الانتيبودي هو عباره عن سابستنسز برودوس باي بلازما سيلز يعني البلازما سيلز هي المصنع اللي بينتج لي منه بينتج لي الانتيبوديز البلازما سيلز دي موجوده وين موجوده في الليمف نودز موجوده في البون مارو اند السبلين اوكي والسيلز دي عباره عن افويد واكسنترالي بلايس نيوكليوس والسايتوبلازم بتاع بيزو فوليك و1 plasma cell produces antibody of one class we be who are reactive with only one antigen و افتكر كلام الانتيبودي ده قديم شريف اخذناه من زمان جدا اوكي this is not an exercise لكن دي عشان انتو ترجعوا مع نفسكم كده للمرجع اللي انا ارفقته مع الفيديو ده Uh, وتشوفوا الكلاس بتاعت الانتيبوديز وكل واحدة الفانكشن بتاعها شنو الرياكشن بتاعها uh, بيكون كيف اوكي يو كان جاست تيك ا لوك على الريفرنس اوكي وذين ذوز كامينج سلايدز احنا هنجتهد شوية كده وهنراجع على الريفرنس برضو وهنشوف ال الانتجين انتي بودي رياكشن ميكانيزم كيف بتحصل وشنو هي الستبس بتاعتها اوكي وانا هديكم بس جست اهنت يعني
طيب عندنا uh, three states uh, primary secondary tertiary في ال primary state بيكون uh, there is initial interaction ما بين ال two اللي هما منو الانتجين والانتيبادي without any visible effect يعني بيكون ال reaction بسيط شديد and this reaction is rapid and occurs even at low temperature يعني حتى ما بيستهلك شنو a lot of energy and also is reversible because intermolecular forces between antigen and antibody are weaker يعني زي الاثنين بشكل وكده بعدين بيرجعوا حبايب زي ما كانوا اوكي يعني بتكون شنو يعني شكلها خفيفه كده اما في السكندري ستيت اوكي ات ليدز تو ا precipitation ugly agglutination lysis of cells killing of live antigens neutralization of motile organisms and enhancement of phagocytosis هنا بدت تظهر معاي serious reaction and serious يعني شوية كده شنو mechanisms okay Uh, an antigen can stimulate the production of different types of immunoglobulins and antibodies which differ in their reaction and capability and other properties. Nazi the tertiary state some antigen antibody reaction in vivo initiate chain reactions that leads to neutralization or destructions of injurious antigen. or tissue damage يعني هنا تكون حرب فظيعة جدا في tertiary state بيكون عندي هنا a very serious reaction and visible with a visible effect طبعا وممكن يكون عندنا destruction لل injurious antigens وكمان تعمل لي tissue damage and these are tertiary reaction and include humoral immunity against infectious diseases clinical allergy and other immunological diseases والحاجة دي ممكن تلاقينا في some diseases within oral medicine course طيب عندنا هنا general features بتاعت ال antigen antibody reaction يعني شنو هي general features بتاعت ال reaction انه reaction ده بكون specific the reaction is specific okay and antigen combines only with its homologous antibody and vice versa okay كل واحد عارف عدو كويس ومسك فيه وبيظبط الموضوع entire molecules react and not its fragments okay كل المولكيول كده بيعمل لي reaction تمام يعني الانتجين والانتيبودي بيدخلوا الاثنين بكل كيانه وبيعملوا لي reaction Uh, there is no degeneration of the antigen or antibody during the reaction. Has a delta, the combination occurs at the surface, which is firm and reversible. Antigen and antibody can combine in varying proportions. Okay. These coming slides بتوريني ال types of the reaction اللي ممكن تتفاعل بيها ال antigen وال antibody مع بعض ممكن to have a look at it without يعني in depth details كده وبكده احنا نكون خلصنا ال introduction part 1 okay and we are moving to part 2 stay tuned نراجع ال reference and as I told you before انه بس نحاول نركز على الحاجات اللي أنا ذكرتها أكثر شيء، أوكي؟ وزي ما قلنا إنه دي just an introduction، just an يعني beginning عشان إحنا نقدر ندخل في ال oral medicine، لازم نعرف شنو هو ال oral medicine، شنو هي الحاجات المهمة المفترض تكون قاعدة ك basics أو يعني كبداية كده في راسنا عشان نقدر نبني عليها الباقي بكل سهولة، أوكي؟ يعني الجرسون لما يتذكر لي كم حاجة كده أنا هرجع بذاكرتي إنه أيوة الكلام ده صح يتقال لي قبل كده وهربط الكلام ويبقى لي الموضوع very easy، أوكي؟ till the next lecture.